<laughs> okay, welcome guys. So let's get going. We're gonna begin with the Megillah. Have a look at it. First of all, you put the books away. We're gonna start with the Megillah. We're gonna jump to there. And once in a while, we're gonna jump to the course book as well as we go through. So let's begin. So where is this action? Take your bus go. I gave that already, thanks. You got one? Yes, sir. Where is the action of the Purim story take place? Let's begin at the beginning. Where are we? We are in Persia, that's right. Where exactly in Persia? At the capital of Persia, which was called Great Neck. <laughs> See, one joke for the semester, every enjoy this. The area was called Shushan. Shushan. So we're going to look at how we ended up over there. Because before the Jewish people found themselves in Persia, they found themselves in another location, which was called the land of Israel. And we've been there for hundreds of years. King Solomon, well, first of all, Joshua entered us in, in the Jewish year. What year did the Jewish people enter into the land of Israel? Let's start with some basics. You're not going to have to know too many years through life, but two years you're going to have to know. Okay, what year did we leave Egypt? Let's start with that one. 400. Okay, let's go. <laughs> we left Egypt in the Jewish year 2448. Okay, that's when we left. So work out when we entered into the land of Israel. 1312 BCE. Right, so we're going to go with Hebrew date. You're right, absolutely. So we're going to go with, entered into Israel 40 years later, because we were in the desert for 40 years. We entered into Israel in what year? Two, four, eight. Eight, eight. Very good. Someone's going to pass math. <laughs> right. Two, four, eight, eight is when we entered into the land of Israel. Moses did not enter. Joshua did. We were there for hundreds of years. Eventually, we had judges. We had kings. We had someone called King David, who laid the foundations eventually for the first temple, for the Beit HaMikdash. And then his son Shlomo, Solomon, Shalmelech, built the second temple. That temple stood for 110 years, after which somebody called, and this is when our story comes in, Nebuchadnezzar came in, okay? Nebuchadnezzar is the key person who begins our story. Have these dates down, okay? A general rule, anything written on the board, you have to know, Hebrew or English, okay? So let's get some dates down, first of all. So in the year 3318, Nebuchadnezzar takes on the throne of Babylon. I'm gonna write it once, and then I'll try to use it to your hand. Right, takes on the throne, he becomes throne, of Babylon. Babylon was a large and a very powerful empire in the region of, I guess, Iraq today, Babylon, right? He takes over the throne and he becomes the king. In 3319, he wasted no time being the evil dictator that he was. He conquers Yoyakim, conquers Judea, right, as we know it. And basically, the Jewish land becomes like a vassal of Babylon itself, okay? It becomes basically part of his large empire. In three, I'm going to give you the key years. I'm here to mem make you memorize years, but these are key years. 3338, Nebuchadnezzar, henceforth known as N, destroys the temple and exiles the Jewish nation. destroys the first base of Mikdash, and slowly, slowly, the Jewish people start to be exiled from the land. By 3389, a year later, sorry, 33, oh, I'm sorry, that's wrong, 3338, right, by 3389, that's correct, 3389, we have someone called Balshatzar, who takes over kingship from Nebuchadnezzar, and this is an important point we're going to see, all the stuff that this dictator owns ends up coming down to this dictator, Baal Shatzar. Things move on, okay? If 
by 3390, a year later, Cyrus the Great says the Jewish people can rebuild the temple. And they're all ready to do it. They're all ready to do it and get going on it. However, a year after, two years after that, a guy called Achashverosh, Xerxes, takes over and halts the building. Okay? Balshatza dies, the whole story, and to know how that happens, actually a fascinating story, the writing on the wall. What's the last thing? Ahashverosh. He takes over? He takes over Balshatza, yes. He becomes king of this entire province, entire area, actually, as we're going to see, a large suite of land that the previous dictators had taken off. So it goes from Nebuchadnezzar to Balshatza. He destroys the temple, Balshatza owns in between, he takes over as well, and eventually Ahasuerus is the final recipient of the land. And that, ladies, Does he, start the he absolutely, absolutely the building? stops the building of the second temple. He wants he nothing to do with it. Yeah. Our story, the Purim story, one last year, opens up in the year three three nine four. Okay. This is where the Megillah opens the story, okay. which happens to be the third year of his reign, okay? because they count the first year as the first year. So this is the third year of Ahasuerus, hence known as A, reign. Rather they have a rule, there's no cell phones on my class, please. Believe me, I'm as addicted to cell phones as you are. You can put them all away. We'll do one solid hour, and then you can go back to social media right afterwards. Okay. So that's where we are historically. We're now the year 3394, <coughs> and the Megillah opens over there. Now, this is very important information, and this is pretty interesting as well. And it goes like this. The prophet Jeremiah, and Daniel as well, actually, who actually, according to many opinions, features in the Megillah, as we're going to see, had a prophecy. And the prophecy was that the Jewish people would be exiled for a certain amount of time. Does anyone know how long the Jewish people would be exiled in Babylon before they were returned to Israel to rebuild the Second Temple? It's a key number. The number is 70. They were told by the prophet Jeremiah that they would be in exile for 70 years. And then they'd go back. Now what's fascinating about that is that there was a big debate and dispute among the Jews and among the non-Jews, including, including Nebuchadnezzar Balshatzar and, very importantly, Ahasuerus, when that 70 years was going to end. Why would they have a dispute when 70 is going to end? <coughs> Why couldn't they just start counting and figure it out? Anybody? When does it start? When does it start? And that already was a big discussion debate. And everyone had their own calculations, including <coughs> the Jews and the non-Jews as well. Do you start at the actual destruction, the conquering of Judea, right, when the temple was destroyed, when the last Jews were kicked out? There's many different stages, many, many of them actually, and actually the Gemara in Megillah lists a whole bunch of different calculations to how everyone figured it out. Ahasuerus had his own calculation of when it started, and so he also had his own calculation as to when it ended. Now this is very important information, because without this information, you're not going to understand this entire, at least the first chapter of the Megillah. Why? Because the 70-year clock ran out, according to Ahasuerus, on the third year of his reign. That's when the clock ran out. So what is he going to do on the third year of his reign 
in order to signify and to notify the people, specifically the Jews, who are, we're going to see, dispersed all over the world at this point, they were exiled everywhere, but a large portion of Persia and Shushan. What's he going to do to notify this information to them? Throw a party. Why would he throw a party? Why would he just, I don't know, kill them? Make fun of them? Why a party? What was wrong with him that he wanted to throw a party? Yeah. Well, as far as he's concerned, it's all over. The Jews are not going back. Seventy years are finished. My third year on the reign, right? Now, let's remember, there's different opinions, actually, about Achishverosh. Some say he was extremely stupid. And some say, no, 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 he was really, really smart. Think about some politicians, even today. Right, it's a dispute. Either they're really crazy, or they're like super geniuses. That's what I think of Achishverosh. Right? He was a dictator. He grew up in very humble beginnings. And he actually, this is also very important, and also a very important part of the story, did not come from royal blood. He was a military person who went up through the ranks, right? Was, I'm sure, extremely sadistic as they were in those days, and became the leader of the unfree world of its day. So he, as a dictator, had a certain character trait. What do most dictators, what character trait do most dictators have? They have control issues, very nice. Or, as we call it, paranoia. Extreme paranoia. Sometimes they begin by killing everyone, but sometimes they slowly ingratiate themselves into the society. And they want to hold on to power. And think about the dictators that you know about, even in today's day and age, right? They want to hold on to power. So that's the opening scene of the Megillah. And let's have a look. Vayhi b'me'ach shverosh. And it was there, what's the word? Achah shverosh. Is that his name? That's a title, like Pharaoh, or King, or Melech. Achah shverosh actually was not his name. The, the Ma'am Loez, by the way, if you get a chance, it's in English, and it's well worth the read. It'll take you an evening to read right through it, or maybe a couple of evenings. The Ma'am Loez on... Megillah of Esther is the most amazing read. And it reads like a, like a novel. It's unbelievable. He says, well, Achashverosh, two opinions. One, actually, gives a few opinions, but the ones I remember are Ach Rosh. What's Ach? A brother. Rosh? Head. He was the brother of another head. Who's that? Nebuchadnezzar. He was just a continuation of Nebuchadnezzar. Ach Rosh. Right? Like he had his brothers in arms, yeah. He did not come from the line at all. Yeah, I know. But he's like, not part of it. And he's not literally a family. I know, but he's like a brothers in arms. Like, no, no, this is he's completely out of the line. He's gonna try to, we'll see in a moment, marry into it. We're gonna get there in a second. He's gonna marry into it. Because every move he makes is to consolidate his power. But he's not from this line at all. Absolutely not. There's a complete switch and change of it. He's just another dictator who's come and taken power. I'm just saying. He was the main person. He was the leader of his day. Sure, the other people, but he was the main leader of his day. It was Benjamin Nebuchadnezzar, to Another question of Achashverosh is Ach Rosh. What's Ach? Ugh. What's Ugh? Gross. Right? Barosh. He gave the Jewish people a headache because when he kept flip flopping his decrees upon them. Right? So he gave him an ach barosh. He gave him a headache. Okay, follow inside. Who Achashverosh? Hamolech mehodu ad kush. Now, what's hodu? What's hodu? Hodu is India. India. Okay. Kush, you translate as Ethiopia. Right? Now, those two are not that far away from each other. 
But there's actually a machloket. And the Gemara says that some say, as we know, the world is like a circle like that. And here we have India, and here we have, let's say, Ethiopia. Some say, no, well, actually, you read a rule from here to here. And some say, no, no, no. This is actually a statement how powerful he was. He ruled from here right through to here. He had how many provinces over all of his empire? 127. That's what Megillah the itself tells us. So that's an important feature. About Kush Sheva Ba'estrum or Mea Medina, 127 provinces all over the globe. He had far reach, which is going to be problematic for us because when his henchman, Haman, say boo, decides, him do better on Purim, decides that he wants to wipe the Jews out, he's got a far reach to a lot of places where the Jewish people are living at that time. So it's very, very problematic. 127. Does anyone know where we see that number somewhere else? Does anyone think about it? Oh, you know. Think about it. Anyone see that number somewhere in the Bible, in the Torah, about a certain person who lived for 127 years? Is that familiar? You got it. Sarah Emanu. 127 years. Actually, it says she lived for 7 years, and then 20, and then 100 years. Chai Sarah. That's how long she lived. It's an unusual number, 127. It's got to be connected, no? It's got to be connected. It can't just be a random connection. Do you know the connection between them? <coughs> so I'll tell you a story from the Midrash. And the Midrash tells us that Rabbi Akiva was teaching a class. The great Rabbi Akiva. And while he was teaching this class, students start to fall asleep. Which makes me feel much better. Because if they fell asleep in Rabbi Akiva's class, what chance have I got? And he stopped the class and he said, I want to ask you a question. It says in the Gila that Ahasuerus ruled over 127 provinces. And we also know that Esther lived 127 years. What's the connection? I'll tell you. In the great merit of Sarah in Maino, living 127 years, her great, 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 great granddaughter, Esther, got to rule over 127 provinces. Why? Because Esther was the master of time, which is why we divide her years to 7 to 2200. Every year was very eventful for her and used, and she maximized. So the Chidusha of Rim, one of the commentators, says an amazing idea. He says, if we treat every year like a country, like we value space, every month we treat like, sorry, every, yeah, every month like a small city, every day like a village, every moment like a home, we put as much importance into time as we do into space because Sarah made time holy and Esther was able to rule over space so we're connecting those two together because one leads to the other that was the connection he made and why was he making that point because people are falling asleep in his class they're wasting his time that's why he did that so 127 is connected to Sarah Menu in some very very deep deep way the power of time and the power of space okay many generations later Esther has the merit. You're going to learn a lot of amazing things in this class, by the way, I'm just telling you. It's one of my favorite classes that I teach here at Stern College. Okay. Biyamahem, keshevet ha-melech ahashverud. Look inside, we're on verse 2. We're not going to go through all the verses, but there are key points I want to bring out from a number of the verses. Chapter 1 happens to be chock-a-block full of delicious, yummy, important information. Biyamahem, when the king was sitting on his throne. Why is it telling me that the king's sitting, sitting on his throne, Lizzie? We know he's on his throne. He's been there for three years already. What do you think the Megillah is telling us? We're telling us that he's sitting on his throne. What does the idea of sitting represent? What would you say? 
usually a sign of power, but a sign of rest. He feels rested. You hear this? He feels rested. He feels complete. Up to now, he's been a dictator. He's had five. Now he's got control. And it was until the third year. One of the reasons was the 70s was up. The whole time he was freaking out that the Jewish people, according to Jeremiah the prophet and Daniel the prophet, also hinted towards it, were going to go back into the land of Israel. Now he's confident. I got the Jews. And they need us. Who else are going to become the accountants? So he's sitting on his throne. Now he's relaxed on his throne. By the way, you should, I highly recommend writing on these sheets. Use them. Al Kisei Malchuto. Asheba Shushna Bira. He built a massive palace for himself, which goes to many opinions. By the way, where is Shushan today? Do you know? There's no city called Shushan. I don't believe. I don't believe today. You know where Shushan is today? What city? A city called Hamadan. Hamadan. And actually, there are actually the Kever, you can go online, go on YouTube. This is a fascinating video, by the way. Absolutely fascinating. And you see people have taken videos and they visited the Kever, the burial place of Mordechai and Esther, were buried next to each other. And you can visit to this very day. And I know many Persians actually used to go, Erev Purim, some say used to, on Purim, they would go and visit the Kvarim of Mordechai and Esther. It's a very cool, I once showed it in class, I thought it was a few years ago. But you can look up in your own time. Okay? So it's a, a, a location which still exists today. Bishnas Shalosh, on the third verse. Bishnas Shalosh of Malko is now the third year of his reign. Now we know why the third year is important, because remember that's when the seventh year ends. Asa Mishtav Chol Sarav Yavadav. He throws a big party. It's big. And it's also long. Really, really long. How long is this party? Anybody know? You thought you went to a big party the other night, right? A couple of weeks. Keep going. Keep going. 180 days. Six month party. Now that, ladies, is a party. I don't recommend it. I'm going to bed at 8.39 nowadays. But that is how to do it. He makes a Mishnah Chol Sarav for all of his... Now once again, why is he inviting? Call a Sarav, the Call of a Dove. He's inviting his servants, his workers. What's he doing? Why would a dictator, think of the dictator, why would a dictator, why would the head of North Korea throw a party? That's what we're dealing with, right? Best way to think about it. Why would the head of North Korea throw a party and invite all of his... Because he wanted people to like him. Wanted people to like him, yeah. He's now gaining support, grassroots support. He's consolidating his throne. He's sitting on his throne. That's the way they said in the Gila. Following? And he goes and he calls all the nobles and the officials. Now, what does he do at this party? This is fascinating. The Megillah tells us what he does there. Baharoso es Osher Kavod Malchoto. He starts to display the riches of his glorious kingdom. Ve'ed yakar tiferet gedulato. All of the splendor and the excellent majesty. Yamim rabim for many, many days. Shmonim umat yon. 180 days is how long he does it. Tiferet gedulato. Underline those words. Underline those words. Because those words appear in the Torah as well. Does anybody know in relation to what those words appear? We're on verse Dalad. Dalad. Tiferet Gedulah Toh. you got to follow with me. What is that referring to? Yekara Tiferet Gedulah Toh. The splendor of His excellent majesty. So the priestly garments, which I'll refer to as the Big Day Kahuna, the Big Day Kahuna, the clothing that the Kohenim used to wear, is referred to in the book of Exodus, chapter 28, verse 2, as Kavod Ulatiferet. There's that word. Kavod Ulatiferet. 
Says the Gemara in Megillah, there's a connection. The author of the Megillah decided to put in these words to actually tell us what he was doing at this party. Does anyone know what he was doing? He has a wife at this point. But we've just mentioned words of things that he was displaying that he has, that we see a connection between that word and that word when it comes to the big day kahuna. How many big day kahuna were there? What, how many clothings did an ordinary Kohen wear? Four. How many did the Kohen Gadol wear? Eight. And they refer to as very glorious clothings. Right, you had the tzitz and the tznef and the me'il, beautiful, and there were golden parts to it, right? You know what he did? He dressed up. But why is he wearing that? Why is he, he could have worn a golden cloak. He's making a point. Maybe he's trying to show that he's close to God and like this is what Could be. It could be. Yeah. So actually, I don't think he was mocking them as much as saying to them, I'm your new Kohen Gadol. You're not going back. It's over. I'm my priest. By the way, where did he get his clothing from? Where did he get the clothing of the Kohen Gadol from? If it was the original or some copy? Anyone know? Well, dictators take over countries and they steal, they loot. Then the next dictator comes along and he takes all their stuff. And the next one comes along, it got passed down from the destruction of the all the way down, right to the ends of Nachashverosh's hands. And so, says the Megillah, he dresses up as Kohen Gadol. There is a fantastic painting, which I want you all to look up, by Rembrandt, who was obsessed with biblical scenes. He's got a whole bunch of them. A few of them out in the Gila. And you'll actually see that Balshatzar is dressed up in the big day kahuna with writing on the wall, because he was told that night that his kingdom was going to be, he was going to die, and his kingdom was going to be divided and handed over, which it was that night. Right? He was killed by one of his own soldiers as a mistake. And you'll see the Rembrandt even depicted Balshatzar dressed as the Kohen Gadol. And that's what Achishverosh did. He dressed up and said, it's over. It's all done. Chalas. The Jews are not going back. I am your high priest. So maybe he was mocking them. But to a large degree, he was also making a point. Look at verse 5. Ovimlot hayamim ha'ele asa melech wachala nimsai v'shushna bira l'migdol v'archatan after this party, he did something else. What did he do? He threw another party. How long was this party for? One week. Who was invited? Look inside. Who was invited? Everyone in Shushan. Migadol, the great people. Vakatan. Even the small people. That's not a reference to their height. It's a reference to their stature. Now what is he doing? What is this Meshuggah doing? Now he wants to get the trust of the people in the town. Great, Sabrina. Now he wants to get the trust of the people in his town. Is that a smart move? Or is that a stupid move? Smart. Could he have done it smarter? Maybe by giving them food instead of throwing a party? He gave them food. No, oh, instead a lot of, of food. like having a party, like he could have just like them their home rather than break I'm talking about your making I'm talking about the timing of it. Could he have done it smarter through the timing of it? Uh, yeah, like that. So go on, Like later, because why would you have a party where after you had another party and you invited everybody else? Like everyone was already invited. What's it, what's, what what message are you sending people in Shushan? People around you, what message are you sending them? That you're more important than people from outside Shushan. Why does he want to tell the people around him that they're, he's, that they're more important than people from all the rest of those provinces? Go on. What's what? Remember, he's in paranoia. That's the way to think of it, okay? Trying to hold on to consolidate power. 
You want to ask this question or ask something else? Yeah. Go. Oh, like the original like, Okay, I think it's a stupid thing. Because, okay, you're a dictator. Like, why would you want to get close oh. to the people? Like, so at this point, like, he's... Like, you want to show that you have more power over them. If your friend is a... So he's trying to consolidate over here. So he wants to like, you know what, everyone's my friend, right? And then he starts to wipe people out. Well, I feel like he wants to gain um, trust of these people because if they, if people like plan attack on him. Like, Beautiful. Like, if people come to attack you, who are the first ones come and get you? People right around you, right? First of all, the people that are literally right around you. Then the people in your town, people schlepping from far away till they get there, till they arrive. So one second. So did he do it well or did he do it badly? What should he have done? Yeah? Like the second party first. Oh, that's what I want to get to. He should have had the second party first. This is a machloket, Rav and Shemur. One opinion is that, you know what? This was the stupidest move. If you want to go solidate power, stop with people around you and then you can start to breach out. So I say, no, 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 no. First of all, you want to get all the big empires involved. And at the end, right at the end, you want to get the people that are close to you, make sure they're surrounding you and protecting you in case anyone gives you any trouble. All right? So it's actually a machloket. Some say genius move. Some say absolutely idiotic. Okay? Absolutely idiotic. But he's inviting everyone from Shushan, Katan, Mishneh, Shivat Yamim, Bitan HaMelach. This is a beautiful party. This is the... Um, the after party, right? Literally, the after party. And he decorates the palace that he has. With what does he de decorate this palace? Chur, Karpas, Techelet, sound familiar? Achuz, Bachavli Boots, the Argaman, Al Glili Kesef, the Amudi Sheish. Mitot Zav, Vakesem Aritzpat, Bahar Vesheish, Vedav Soharet. Hangings of white, fine cotton, blue, held with cords of fine linen and purple. Upon silver rods and marble pillars, actually, Techelet is more of an aquamarine or a sky blue. Couches of gold and silver on a pavement of green and white, right? And shell and onyx and marble. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? What's he doing over there? What are dictators wanting people to know? They're rich. Like really, really rich. Dictators want you to know that they have power and they got the money to back up their power. That's why right through history to the very present day, people who want power talk about how much money they got. That's what they do. That's what they do. We are lauded. We got money coming out of our ears. Now, where do you get this stuff from? Solar also. What? Down also. Yeah. A lot of these words, the gold and silver, came from the Beit Hamikdash. And what's he doing? He's inviting everyone. Who does he invite specifically? The Jews. He wants the Jewish people there. He wants them to see what happened to their temple. Do they go to this party or do they not go to this party? Do they go or do they not go to this party? What could be some problems of them going? What? Ah, I'm missing you. Say louder. They don't go. You say they don't go. Yeah. Anyone thinks they do go? Oh, they go. Yeah, they went. Yeah. Oh, they went. Some problems with them going to the party. Kashrut. Kashrut? It ain't kosher? Or actually, maybe it is. What else? They have kosher food. They have kosher food? He was smart. He wants them to come. He wants them to be there. And they all go. The Gemara tells us that actually one of the reasons 
one of the reasons, actually the Gemara actually ends up squashing this idea, but one of the original reasons why the Jewish people ended up almost being destroyed was for going to this party and enjoying everything that was there. Because it was a very splendid party and the Jews went. Except one person. One person did not go to the party and he refused to go. And he probably had a hard time from people for not going. Because all of the rabbis were there. Or at least allowing their congruence to go. Who was that? Mordechai. Mordechai did not go. Why didn't go? We're going to see. But he's going to be the thorn in the side that's going to lead to the end of this story. Okay, we're going to look at a lot of themes that run through the Megillah, but we've already seen a couple of them. Oh, actually, we saw one big one. One that we've seen, we saw so far is clothing. Okay? Clothing. The incidence of clothing. Which clothing have we seen so far? The Kohen Gadol's clothing, right? He dresses up as the Kohen Gadol, as the high priest. <coughs> We're about to see another incidence of clothing. Does anyone know who that's going to be? Vashti. Right. Who was Vashti? Vashti was his wife. Where did she come from? So she was actually, some say, a granddaughter of Ebenezer. And when he took over, he took her too and made her into his queen. Anybody here feel sorry for her? No. Whatever you do, do not feel sorry for Vashti. She was an extremely evil dictator's wife who took full control over the situation that she found herself in and relished it and absolutely relished it. She was also a keen and despicable anti-Semite and would torture and humiliate the Jewish women in her town to the nth degree. Feel no embarrassment for her. So the Jewish people go to the party. Verse six, Vashkot v'chlezav, they drank from golden goblets, the kalim mekalim shonim, Every single goblet was different. No two goblets were the same. That means you drank from one, you put it down, you took another one. There was a vast amount of wealth that had been collected. Remember, when they start to defeat areas around them, they suck all the money and all the silver and the gold into one central location. Even the Nazis, in Machshimam, even the Nazis did a very similar thing. Once a year, I lead a trip to Poland and Prague. You go to Prague, and you see that the city was not destroyed. There's a lot of Jewish stuff there. Because the Nazis, Hitler wanted to make Prague the Jewish museum for this gone Jewish nation. And you see all the Kisrei Torah, the, the Torah crowns are there in the yards, and all the money, the charity box, silver boxes, collected all together, right? They console it, put it together. The Yain Malchut Rav. There's a lot, a lot of wine and drinking. Kiyat HaMelech. Vashtia Kedat. And the wine is? What's Kedat? Kosher. He has kosher wine there. Ain Ones. What's Ain? What's Ones? Nobody is forced. Forced to do what? Forced to drink. Why would anyone be forced to drink? That's the way they used to do. They used to throw these parties and they used to force people to drink so they became delirious till they died. Right? These parties, people literally die at these parties. You know, later on, like the vomitariums they would go to, you know, to purge and come back and eat more. Right? Six month party. Yeah. So they used to like have these crazy drinking bouts. No, 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 no. There's kosher wine. You're not going to be forced. He's Mr. Nice dictator now. He came to Salamelech. I'll call Rav Beitel, I saw Skirusan Ish for Ish. And so the king had ordered all the officers of his house, they should do according to every man's pleasure. 
I'm not going to be forced into it. Relax. We're going to have a good time. Now, let's meet Vashti. Gam Vashti Hamalka Asta Mishten Nashim Beit Almachot. Verse 9. Gam Vashti Hamalka Asta Mishten Nashim Beit Almachot. Asher Melech HaCheverush. What is she up to? What's she doing? What does she do? She throws them in a party. Now, when I was a kid and I read this, I thought, oh, she's so tznua. She's so modest. Is it tzniut? Right? She wants to have a private party for the women on one side with a machitza and a party for many other side. Let me be very, very clear. She is the furthest thing from a modest woman. Not modest in nature, not modest in action, not modest in behavior. So what are you doing over here? Think very carefully. Process into your mind. What is she doing? Assume she's not a modest person, which I'm going to prove to you a little bit later that she isn't. Why is she throwing her own party when her husband, Akash Berosh, is throwing his own party? Great question, right? Great question. You're going to love this. Oh, this is going to love. So we were playing tennis today, me and you. That's, what, that's what my rubber used to say when I would answer so many questions. I yeah. think it's because um, she's trying to keep the women closer yeah. so if they don't like go. Okay. Or like, okay. keep an eye on them. Like, keep so it's eye. keeping an eye on the women who are there? Okay, could be. Could be. I'll buy into that. Why else? So the fascinating answer is, there's a political struggle happening. You see, she is saying to her husband, you think you're the ruler? You're not the ruler. I am the one of royal blood. This is my party. He's still fairly fresh to the throne. She is actually pushing back on his malchus. she referred to? How she referred to? Look inside. This is very, very telling. It's not how she referred to. She referred to as a full title, please. What's a full title? Vashti Hamalka. Vashti the Queen. Is that good? Or is that bad? What's your name again? Miriam. Miriam, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing to be called Vashti the Queen? Um, yeah. That's what you want. That's what you want? What she want? She wants power. Good. So, so, so what does she want to be called? Vashti the Queen. Vashti the Queen. Not Vashti the King. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You know in England, we have a queen. What's her full title? Queen Elizabeth. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's interesting. Queen Elizabeth. What's she called? Vashti Amalka, Vashti the Queen. Her name first, and then her title. And that, you're gonna see, is how Ahasuerosh refers to her. Ahasuerus refers to her as Vashti the Queen. Now we're going to see that she's going to respond to him via a messenger because he's going to call her to the party to dance at the party with no clothes on as we're going to see in a couple of moments. There's a hint to that in the Megillah and the Gemara verifies this. When she responds, she refers to herself as 
Miriam? Queen Vashti. Queen Vashti, that's right. That's how she refers to herself. So you see there's a political intrigue that is happening below the surface between Vashti and Ahasuerus. Sabrina, what do most dictators do when they feel threatened? That's what they do. You had a question? You had a hand up? Yeah. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Isn't it always like in Hebrew, it's long, the name can be like the adjective about it? Like So there's nothing, I guess, wrong with that. Over here, there's an interplay. Over here, there's an interplay. Seemingly, the title should come first. But you're right. We do refer to it as David Hamela. But that could be for humility reasons. Right? Good point. That he is referred to as Melchah David as well. Here, the fact that she refers to herself one way and him another way shows they're coming from different places. Okay. Okay. We're going to stop over there. We will pick this up next class. Because I want to start a new theme over here. Please bring your books with you. Please bring your Megillah sheets or your Megillahs with you for next class. Thank you. Liz, you can turn on the video. Thank you so much.